Welcome to ASOR's first ever, but not last, virtual annual meeting. I am sitting virtually in front of the site of Cyrene in Libya, because I want to emphasize that our virtual meeting is broader and more inclusive than ever before. We already have over 1,050 registrants and attendees to this meeting, and we expect that number to reach 1,100 before the meeting concludes next week. The research presented stretches from North Africa and the wider Mediterranean to the Indus Valley. To wit, we have paper presenters from 28 countries and conference registrants from 39 countries and six continents. Yes, you heard correctly, 39 countries and six continents. We're only missing Antarctica. Thanks to the support from the U.S. Embassy to Libya, we have 10 presenters from Libya. Generous ASOR members provided 21 scholarships to students and scholars from Lebanon in an effort to help in a small way following the Beirut blast. Of course, our plenary speaker, Dr. Monica Hanna, is coming to us live from Egypt. Speaking of scholarships, I'm pleased and proud that we fulfilled our commitment to meet 100%, 100% of virtual annual meeting scholarship requests. As of yesterday, that means a total of 97 scholarships for $7,000. In addition, we have awarded 92 member scholarships for a total of $8,500. All of these scholarships have been supported by generous gifts from our members, as well as through registration fees from the Friends of ASOR monthly webinars. Our members and friends are truly amazing. Thank you. Hands down, the primary reason for the success of this annual meeting rests with the excellent and broad content, all of which is peer reviewed. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to the program committee and session chairs for assembling these rich and vibrant presentations. Special thanks goes to the program committee co-chairs, Dr. Helen Dixon and Dr. Allison Thomason. I also bring greetings to all ASOR members from the ASOR staff. For the last 13 years, I have opened our annual meeting by saying how much we, the ASOR staff, look forward to this weekend and being able to greet you personally. While we celebrate the tremendous and virtual success that spans 39 countries, the staff and I truly miss seeing and visiting with you in person. Looking forward to next year in Chicago, I'm thrilled to announce that the program committee approved just yesterday two components for the 2021 annual meetings. One, we will meet in person at the Hilton Chicago over our normal dates. November 17 to 20. Two, there will be an additional virtual component held three weeks later, December 9 to 12. There will be one registration rate for both components and you can submit paper and session proposals for either or both the in-person and virtual components. More details will be forthcoming very soon. Last, but certainly not least, I want to thank our sponsors and exhibitors. We especially thank our platinum sponsor, University of Chicago Press, as well as our silver sponsors, Repholz Publishers and Penn State University Press. As you review the more than 430 papers, posters, and presentations, please take some time to drop by the virtual exhibit gallery as well. Thank you for attending. And I now introduce ASOR's president, Dr. Sharon Herbert, who will give another welcome and introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Monica Hanna. Hello to all from wherever on the globe you are watching this event. I'm Sharon Herbert, and as president of ASOR, I am pleased to welcome you to the plenary session which is kicking off ASOR's 120th and first virtual annual meeting. This event has made, been made possible by the hard work and fantastic planning of our staff, 
our wonderful volunteer program committee, and over 450 presenters who mastered the technologies to record their papers two weeks early before this meeting. Many thanks to all and to the 1,000 plus registered members attending by Zoom, more than came to sunny San Diego last November. Our plenary speaker today is Dr. Monica Hanna, Acting Dean of the College of Archaeology and Cultural Heritage at the Arab Academy of Science, Technology, and Maritime Transport in Aswan, Egypt. Dr. Hanna was born in Heliopolis and is originally from the region around Middle Egypt. She began her academic studies at the prestigious American University in Cairo, where she majored in Egyptology with a minor in archaeological chemistry. She then pursued her doctorate at the University of Pisa with a dissertation on the problems of preservation of mural paintings in the Theban necropolis, a pilot study on the Theban tomb 14 using 3D scanning technologies. Throughout her studies, and especially since completing her PhD, Dr. Hanna has been actively involved with protecting Egypt's archeological sites and also with issues of cultural identity. She has been a member of archeological expeditions at Saqqara and Thebes, as well as several cultural research man management projects around Egypt, notably at Sarabit al Qadim. She furthered her research and engagement with cultural heritage through a po postdoctoral fellowship at the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin with a project on contemporary communities and archaeology, investigating the relationship between the inhabitants of modern El Khorna and local archaeological sites. Just last year, Dr. Hanna was appointed as founding dean of the new College of Archaeology of Cultural Heritage at the Arab Academy of Science, Technology, and Maritime Transport. The Academy is part of the Arab League University System with campuses in Cairo, Alexandria, and Aswan. During her postdoc in Berlin, Dr. Hanna decided to return to Egypt to document the looting situation there in light of the 2011 uprising. Making use of the power of social media, Dr. Hanna created and maintains Egypt's Heritage Task Force, which documents these losses of cultural heritage around Egypt and brings them to the attention of the world stage. She has worked tire tirelessly to reduce the illicit trade in antiquities with the government, with government officials to protect Egypt's cultural heritage. For her work, she received the 2014 Safe Beacon Award and has also been called a Monuments Woman by UNESCO. Dr. Hanna's live talk today, entitled, Does the Future of the Past Lie in the Hands of the Living?, builds on all these experiences. Active in the development of archaeological ethics and heritage politics, Dr. Hanna discusses how and why different stakeholders and communities of heritage interact with the growing discourse. In particular, she covers the different stakeholders of heritage with a focus on the Middle East and Africa and their relationships with scholars and institutions from the West. She also questions how tourists interact with objects that are from other cultures and are exhibited in Western museums versus the interaction with heritage in context. She interrogates how these interactions with the past perhaps create a new world equality or inequality of accessibility to heritage and how we can build bridges for future equitable relations. I give you now Dr. Mo Monica Hanna for what will certainly be a wide ranging and stimulating presentation. Good morning. Um, uh, at first, I would like to thank Sharon and Arlene. Um, I've been in touch mm, almost a year ago to prepare this talk today. Um, I would also like to uh, thank Sharon for the introduction. Well, it had, of course, been planned that I would come to deliver this talk in person, but um, due to COVID-19, the plans have changed um, to the online platform. I'm honored and humbled to be giving the plenary address for the ASOR 2020. 
and um, I'm an Egyptologist by training. Um, so despite how I will try to discuss regional examples, I always tend to see uh, heritage and reflect on it through the lens of how I was trained. So I apologize about that in advance. And um, yeah, I'm sorry for the reflective bias that I have about the different experiences of heritage in Egypt. This talk will discuss the different stakeholders of heritage with a focus on the Middle East and Africa and the relationship with the West. Community and public archaeology as disciplines have evolved to focus on creating meaning, relationships and engagements with the past. But then, which past are indigenous communities engaging with? The past written by colonizers, the past written for different stakeholders, or the past claimed by the different groups? Community archaeology in many places has proved a success, while in other places it is still struggling because of several reasons that I hope I'll just uh, overshadow in my uh, talk. I will overview some key studies of how the different communities in the region relate or contest their past. Furthermore, I'll touch upon how expat communities also relate to, the national to their national heritage abroad. For example, how the Egyptian community in Berlin relate to the past of Nefertiti in the Neues Museum. I've also succeeded in interviewing um, um, one member of the Syrian community uh, in Paris. Um, of course, with the political unrest post-Arab um, Spring, some of the refugee communities are also interacting more with heritage uh, in the museums of uh, where they are. Um, With the development of archaeological ethics and heritage politics, I'll try to discuss how and why the different stakeholders of the communities are interacting with that discourse. Heritage engagement, of course, does not happen devoid of heritage inequalities that infringe on human rights in various degrees. Um, heritage interaction became of wider interest when the word communities changed completely how they related to heritage during the COVID-19 lockdown. And I believe that um, this period actually will change our view of the past. The interaction with the past perhaps created a new world equality or inequality of accessibility to heritage. And then we'll finally think together on how we can build bridges for future equitable uh, relations. Um, I want to start by telling a conversation that I had with two Egyptian women who are living in Berlin. They are Egyptian women in academia who are at fields quite far away from archaeology and cultural heritage. I wanted to know how, how they feel about the museum collections of Egyptian heritage in Berlin, and particularly the reaction towards the famous bust of Nefertiti, which has been a focus, the focus of my research for come uh, for quite some time, and is a forthcoming publication. So I'll start by uh, Professor Dr. Hanin Badr. She is a professor of communication politics and media economics at the Freie University in Berlin. And um, she talks about um, the bust, saying that when you visit Nefertiti, it is so overwhelming. It is such a delicate and a beautiful bust to look at. It makes me very proud to look at the fine details I went. Um, it makes me very proud to look at the fine details. I went on a private event with someone from the museum I looked at the fine lines, the wrinkles, the fine work our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, did. For me, it was a magical moment. Me, being a woman, and this is our heritage and ancestry. I don't think that Nefertiti's bust is Berliner. Of course, she's not a Berliner. 
she's just used to attract tourists and as they call her in Berlin, uh, Berlin's uh, Schönheide. She belongs in Egypt and now that the Grand Egyptian Museum is being built, I want her to return. She wins money for Berlin and so they are using her in an opportunistic manner. She's on the brochures to visit Berlin. She deserves it, of course. But I don't know why no one say on these brochures that she's Egyptian. What I also experienced um, in the Neuss Museum is that there is no context of history there. My school back in Egypt was, was the Deutsche Schule de Boromarinen, which is very close to the Cairo Museum in Mohammed Mahmoud Street. So um, I used to go to the Cairo Museum a lot during school, and there you can find context for the heritage. Here at the Neuss Museum, I felt that Nefertiti was isolated. The problem is that the West comes with its modernization theory that we are not, we Egyptians are not modern enough to take care of our heritage. Why doesn't Egypt have archeological missions excavating the Roman remains in Germany, as there are many German missions in Egypt. Nefertiti is such a beauty that um, it, the bust makes her come alive. One day, perhaps not so soon, she should be back to Egypt. What I love about Nefertiti's history is the Akhenaten's period. It is very rich and contested and reminds me of the contemporary religious communities and their fights. I like how the revolutionary act of Akhenaten and how she as a loving wife helped him through and mothered his six daughters. Akhenaten too is not shown with the high ego of other Egyptian pharaohs in terms of iconography. I think they were a very loving couple. Their story of their life in, in in a changing time of Egyptian history and should be explained in length in the different uh, history books of the schooling system of Egypt. Unfortunately, the way we study about ancient Egypt is very boring and doesn't focus on the evolution of the different ideas in Egypt. We still look at the ancient Egyptian through the European lens that is Orientalist and colonial. It also serves the current neo-colonialist agenda. So this was uh, the first comment by uh, Professor Hanin Bad, um, who also had a German education throughout her life. The second comment uh, we get from Suha Roshid. She's uh, a PhD uh, candidate and um, uh, her work is on futures and, and, and foresight practitioners. That's not fortune telling, but rather more of um, writing scenarios for uh, the development uh, uh, of ideas in the future. So Soha says that um, I lived in Berlin for a long time, but it took me some time to go visit her. I was surprised that there was loads of other Egyptian monuments in the Neuss Museum in Berlin. There are so many treasures inside. I realized that they took a lot of it as part, uh, as part of the partage system uh, of the Egyptian law then. There was a part that said that actually they, they have tricked the Egyptians into uh, getting Nefertiti um, as bust out. out. Um, I she said, Soha said then, uh, I don't know the real, really about how the story worked. My first impression was that I found Nefertiti much smaller than I have anticipated. I always thought that she must have been bigger that, uh, than, than I thought. Maybe because of uh, the other uh, colossal monuments that we have. But I always thought that she's bigger than this. I was in awe for the amount of intricate details. They couldn't have <laughs> that amount of detail and color. I couldn't imagine these colors so many years ago. But the Germans treat her, treat her well. She has her own room and she has many guards. 
In terms of where she's located in the museum, she has a very special treatment. There is a corner for those visually disabled to be able to experience her through um, a copy. I think Nefertiti is not a Berliner and cannot be a Berliner. The Berlin identity as a city itself is changing. I don't see Nefertiti as part of the Berlin scene at all. I don't see a fit for the bust in the cultural scene of Berlin. Berlin is hip and cheap. Nefertiti is royal and ancient. They just don't match. She doesn't pick the Berlin vibe. Our monuments abroad probably get a much better treatment. But recently, objects were also vandalized in Berlin. However, they're making so much money off Nefertiti's bust. And also, they do a lot of marking, and it's not right that way. I think about an Egyptian child and a German child, both going on separate museum trips. How does a German child relate to Nefertiti? This is not their history. It's a nice thing to have, but the children for sure relate to the Deutsches Museum. But how does a German child relate to Nefertiti? I think it is very unfair that a lot of Egyptian children will grow up and will not see Nefertiti. And it's not like um, the 100 million people have seen the Egyptian, the pyramids, but a good percentage of them have. It's really unfair and should not be that way. Heritage doesn't need to be universal by taking objects of one culture and keeping it. To have it for good is not the way forward. It's official plunder. It's not only about Nefertiti. The Assyrian heritage is also plundered next to uh, the Neuss Museum and the Pergamon Museum on the Museum Island. People go to Berlin to see the Holocaust monuments and go visit the Auschwitz. Why is Nefertiti part of this heritage? When I lived in Dubai in 2013, I used to go to Qatar for meetings. There I met a German professor who was 80 years uh, old then. I challenged him to guess my nationality and he immediately told me you are Egyptian because you have a long face like Nefertiti. I felt exalted. That comment really made my day then. I feel I'm part of Nefertiti and Nefertiti is part of who I am. I don't identify with Clo Cleopatra as much as I under identify with Nefertiti. And I don't think, um, mm, I didn't think about it until I heard about the new film and the news of Gal Gadot, who will take the leading role. But how about Hatshepsut? I don't know how she looks like. I will Google her iconography now. And um, that was uh, Soha's um, interaction uh, and, and reflection about the past of Nefertiti. And here we also have um, a modern uh, artistic expression by the Egyptian artist Hossein Girard um, uh, on, on inspired. And he keeps drawing multiple Nefertitis uh, uh, many times. Well, Nefertiti is the ambassador of Egypt in Berlin. A statement? said by both Egyptian and German officials alike. To have an ambassador in a country, there must be a diplomatic exchange. There must, and with the negotiations, of course, of uh, sending royal insignia in exchange for the bust, no German object has ever arrived at Cairo or Amarna, where the bust came out from. Nefertiti's bust has become the symbol of the transformation of the Egyptian heritage where the empire, as a symbol of Western imperialism, has turned a historical ruler into a controlled ambassador in an imperial capital. This has in turn delayed critical transformation in the ideology of museums that continue to display Egyptian collections. Questioning the ethical repercussions of colonially acquired heritage is mostly very far from these museum discourses. Voices of indigenous populations have just started to be heard. The conflict over the right of having to say in curating and the representing of Egyptian culture was also very evident in the artistic expression of the body of Nefertiti. 
Polish artists, known as Little Warsaw, authored a display for the Hungarian pavilion at the Venus Binale. The display put uh, the bust on a bronze nude figure with the blessing of then director of the Altes Museum, Dietrich Wildung. The Egyptians felt their queen humiliated and her cultural context disrespected. Farouk Hosni, uh, the ousted uh, the minister of the Mubarak regime, protested then publicly to the German Museum, not because the bust was part of an artistic installation, but was deemed insensitive for the cultural history of Egypt. Nefertiti's bust, with its imperialist nationalist identity, is also a symbol of the social disease of nostalgia and longing widespread today in Egypt and perhaps in Germany too. The nationalists in Egypt long for the glorious past of ancient Egypt. The Western neo-imperialists long for the time when it was possible to populate museums with objects of other cultures. John Baud Baudrillard explained how modern is cold, how our modern is cold while the ancient is usually warm because objects in the museum allow the visitor to usurp and thereby tame the cultural other. Unfortunately, the way archaeological research, um, the way that archaeological research um, has shaped and controlled, um, has been shaped and controlled is very concomitant to how particular nation states interact economically, culturally, and politically. Both Germany and Egypt have turned to archaeology to imagine national confidence in which Nefertiti's bust continue to play a fundamental role. Imperialist, imperialist archaeology has always been at work making indigenous communities invisible only to appropriate their past. The West has hence become the rightful heir of ancient Egypt through a system of knowledge production that controls the Egyptian heritage. The Nefertiti bust is just the tip of the iceberg on how knowledge is produced in a multipolar world in the egalitarian mode of information creation. It shows how Nefertiti has become like many of us, a citizen of the world, but perhaps also um, one day, as has been here called by the Berlin Morgan Post, that um, she has been called that she's the most beautiful immigrant in Berlin. Um, well, we hope that one day that the most beautiful immigrant uh, in Berlin could get um, a chance to come home. I move um, here also, we have um, a very recent a reappropriation pack of the bust of Nefertiti um, in the post-Arab spring, where uh, women, when they were um, sexually harassed in Tahrir Square, they they used this image of Nefertiti wearing uh, a gas mask. Um, it was first, I think, produced in some of the Egyptians' protests in Berlin, and then were later employed by Egyptians, and it was sprayed over the different walls um, in Egypt. Here, there's another uh, testimonial, um, or a, a reflection rather than a testimonial, from um, another Syrian academic in France. Um, who's an asylum seeker, and he asked that I conceal his name for his personal safety. I spent all my life learning archaeology. I will never be able to go back to Syria as long as Assad will be in power. I'm an Assyriologist, and so all the collection of the Louvre is now what I can relate to here in such a lonely place like Paris. Every time I miss our museums, storerooms, and archives, I take a stroll to see the collection and it hurts. It hurts because I cannot decide whether I'm happy to see the objects here safe from the Assad regime and safe from Daesh, or that they are too are in exile like myself. All what I'm trying to do now is to raise awareness on the looted objects, so we are able to track these objects sold by Daesh on the art market. I live with the hope that one day both me and the objects would get repatriated 
without fear of arrest or destruction, where we can together create a new historical narrative for our country. And then he really could not um, continue the conversation after that. I've always wondered how museum visitors interact with objects that are from other cultures. Here we see two objects from the Metropolitan Museum. I mean, and of course, um, how, how these objects exhibited in Western museums versus, of course, the interaction with heritage uh, in context. In the UNESCO 1972 declaration, we first get introduced to this idea of world heritage, a heritage that has, quote, universal heritage value. Needless to remind that most of those who wrote the 1972 uh, declaration were from the Northern Hemisphere, with much less representatives from the source countries and indigenous communities. Many of the museums, such as the Metropolitan Museum, um, uses the heavily politically charged definitions such as universality and multiculturalism uh, to explain their uh, collection. As such, the museum is narrated and represented as a place with the, quote, universal, quote, right to represent the world's material culture on behalf of the colonized nations, responding, of course, to any claims of repatriation as provisional, if not utterly ridiculous or impossible. The same is replicated also in the archaeological academic world, where the Anglo-American publishers produce books on global archaeology that are mostly written by Western scholars or those they know have embraced the colonialist narratives and with almost no critical indigenous voices. I remember when I was attending a debate in the Cardozo Law School in New York in 2014, when I came to receive my Safe Beacon Award, that one of the panelists said that we here in America are, in, are made of multiple cultures, and so we are entitled to have emblems of these cultures uh, here for the different diaspora communities. The argument, um, is not only advocated by lawyers, but also by museum curators. The declaration on the importance and value of universal museums in 2004 showed that 19 museums um, uh, of course, who signed the declaration were institutions of previous imperialist and colonialist powers without a single country of which material culture has been taken out. As uh, Magnus Vigico justly wrote, this declaration is a rich club defense of holding onto objects amassed on the principle that colonial and imperial uh, right is might, uh, of that colonial and imperial might is right. The declaration entails that restituting objects would narrow down the collections of we the Western museums. It also claims that there would be this would be a disservice to all visitors. As a matter of fact, disregarding world travel inequality, many indigenous communities are unable to fly to the West because they cannot obtain a visa or simply because they cannot afford it. It is the illusion of Western elite culture with ideas of universal that is the most perturbing aspect of the declaration as uh, uh, Curtis has said in 2006. Some critiques also discussed what if these objects, uh, when repatriated, would get destroyed? And here I do not refer to terrorist destruction. But what if this heritage is actually part of a tribe's property? And to repatriate it, part of its associated heritage is to be destroyed. How do we, as curators of the past, can deal with such loss? or actually gain of priceless living heritage. The books about the past are usually written in European languages and seldom translated to indigenous languages, causing 
a radical barrier of inaccessibility. And of course, between the communities and the knowledge produced about their cultural heritage. This lack of access to the knowledge is very much the case with many communities in Africa and the Middle East. These communities are ridiculed many of the times for their lack of interest or inability to access the knowledge written in a foreign language about archaeology, which is, of course, translated to justify why Western museums should not repatriate their heritage, basing the rationale on the discontinuity pretext. There is actually no relationship between their ancient past and present. But the question is, how can we ask people to appreciate something they don't know about? And here I recall the great talk of last year for Professor Eric Klein on writing for the public. And I add to it also in languages the indigenous communities can read. Western practitioners in the Middle East and Africa have long privileged their specialized forms of knowledge for the contemporary use or meaning of the past in the present. Motivated by political and economic gain alongside research, over 20, 200 years of Western archaeological exploration, education, travel, and media attention have led to the creation of an ideational space in which the ancient and the modern communities are two separate hermetically sealed entities. Living communities have been denied identification with their history due to Western perceptions of, of course, diluting the cultural influence coming from Christianity or Islam or uh, um, whatever. Thus, the communities living within and near archaeological sites have been positioned as mere adjuncts to the scholarly Western research. Um, and of course, successively, the Western influence local governments alike. Local communities' exclusion from their own ancient past extends to education, excavation training, or lack of it. Media and laws pertaining to heritage access and use, resulting in creation of nations where each living generation, excluding those privileged to private education and international travel, are intellectually and culturally and physically detached from their wider heritage. While these developments reveal how many pasts are viewed as removed from today's social landscape and wider social history by national governments and foreign academics alike. Those actually living in and among archaeological sites want to re-engage with sites and re-establish what were once highly integrated cultural narratives which place the past physically, spiritually, and mythically at the heart of local and national collective identities. In order to change this, the dichotomy between communities and the current education systems and governments, and between the different stakeholders in the region, archaeologists, developers, tourists, tour guides, entrepreneurs, NGOs, and governmental bodies ha have been, ha must um, address such inequality. The problem inherent in all Western work with post-colonial nations remains centered on finding a means to escape centuries of interaction that has privileged Western ideology and thus established a one-way direction of the so-called intercultural development. In terms of dealing with the pasts of these nations since the 1970s, of course with the development of the critical theory, political action by numerous post-colonial indigenous communities and the growth of social political discussions with archaeology has triggered large-scale academic evaluation of existing methodologies. However, for a topic focused largely on physicality, investigation and appropriation of physical remains of the past, alongside intangible aspects, output remains largely theoretical and lacks practical solutions. 
Part of the problem is the ideology of protectionism, extending between nations as well as individual tourist businesses, archaeological missions, ministers, and local governors. This compartmentalization also plagues the various academic fields involved in the study of Egypt, Iraq, Syria, and the Sudan. For example, Egyptologists tend to be unwilling to adopt models and results from the anthropological research, and there is little interaction between those who study ancient Egyptian uh, history, those who study uh, Christian Byzantine Egypt, those who study Islamic Egypt, and those, of course, who work on modern Egypt and the time of Muhammad Ali. This maintains the unhelpful compartmentalization and hierarchy of knowledge established in the early days of the Enlightenment thought. To find a real place of value in the 21st century social discourse, all parties interacting with the past need to open doors, work together, and absorb the theoretical and methodological benefits that interdisciplinary collaboration within tourism studies, development programs, 2030 SDGs, economic strategies, education policy, archaeology, political science, and other fields that are intimately connected with the production and consumption of the different pasts could yield. Working in a multi and an interdisciplinary manner will help sh sharing experience while maintaining awareness of the colonial foundations of the traditional Western tourism production and heritage practice in the region. This has encouraged many archaeological projects to open the door for innovative forms of heritage education, training, and community collaboration, which will finally be able to match the theoretical assertions of post-colonial intercultural heritage intervention and development. At the moment, there is a new wave of um, historians, museologists, edu uh, education experts, archaeologists, who are taking steps to develop people-centered, local and cultural relevant methods of communication um, in terms of uh, dealing uh, with heritage. There is clearly a link between care for heritage, interaction with tourists and tourist economy, looting, and the level of historical knowledge and access to sites in communities living on and around heritage areas. Change will only take place through the development of a more flexible methodology for learning about the past based on culturally relevant context-specific and imaginative learning. Thus, um, if we manage to propose this form of locally-based history education as the cornerstone for heritage collaboration, this would have uh, an impact on mitigating looting, increasing mutual gain, effective and economic uh, interaction uh, with the heritage, and, of course, an improvement for all the stakeholders of archaeological sites. This is necessary in the formation of new and local national identities and the development of um, a working heritage policy. Such um, local-based history provides also a cornerstone for long-term heritage collaboration. Archaeologists often privilege written history as the only true and rarely uh, record oral traditions of communities um, of the sites they excavate. Such local oral legends and practices are important because they constitute the locally conceived truth about the archaeological sites and the basis of how neighboring communities regard and interact with antiquities and monuments. Well scattered and anecdotal evidence of such conce conceptions can be found in a variety of sources. Community archaeology devel mm, developed in the 1970s and 80s out of the political action of numerous post-colonial indigenous communities such as the Native Americans and the Australian aborigines. 
these community-led demonstrations went alongside the appearance of the critical theory and the growth of socio-political discussions within archaeology to create a social and academic environment that would no longer stand for archaeological or white western hegemony. Within this setting, archaeologists began to initiate the first community archaeology projects that were um, predominantly in Australia and the United States in the late uh, 80s and 90s. Here, um, how do we f define also the community of heritage? This is um, a good friend of mine from Heliopolis who have created uh, the Heliopolis Heritage Initiative. Heliopolis is a city north, um, north east of Cairo. And uh, the community there were very upset for the destruction of the urban heritage. And they created um, this group called Heliopolis Heritage Initiative. Um, and here we see him in the metro, the or the tram, that was completely stopped. Um, and, and sold out. These were, I think, the last or the final trips that the Trump took around Heliopolis. So here he was there documenting what was left uh, of the heritage. So the community of heritage uh, does not necessarily mean um, these communities who live particularly about around archaeological sites. And we can define it that on the very basic level, it's a group of individuals living within the vicinity or in the area of some um, heritage importance where they place their own, the different values uh, to the heritage. Um, of course, the term community seems to imply a sense of cohesion and solidarity created through a common interest in a shared uh, interest. This cohesion, of course, is created uh, rather than mm, an, uh, an authentic um, situation. Communities are rarely homogenous. Uh, they're different, they're diverse, and um, the rec recognizing uh, a community um, also leads to the homogenization of this community as multiple intersecting identity construct constructs such as class, gender, religion, economic status, ethnicity are addressed. This location-based concept is therefore useful to as a starting point for investigating the relationship between the different populations and particular heritage sites, as it can incorporate the multiple identities of groups working within a community without seeking to divide them. Um, the first project that has employed um, community uh, archaeology in Egypt um, was that of Professor Stephanie Moser from Southampton University in 1999 and lasted for a few years. The project was a huge success during uh, the funding phase, but when the project ended, unfortunately, all the activities were stopped. And in my last visit to al Qusayr, I could not find anyone who remembered the different activities within the communities 20 years afterwards. The same was for a project that I directed in Sarabit al Khedem, which after the funding ended, after three years, the project lasted from 2007 to 2010. None uh, of the activities continued. The situation has also worsened due to the ban on tourist visits due to due to the security concerns in Sinai. Other projects in Egypt, in Memphis, the Delta, Menia, and Asyut that I have observed have also had the same fate. Some even did not get the security clearance to carry out their activities because anthropological research permissions are not easily obtained unless foreign archaeological missions have a local Egyptian partner. The situation also repeats in the region as per the feedback of colleagues from Jordan, Syria, Oman, and the Sudan. The only exceptions are in the sites of uh, uh, Karak, Tafila, and Mafraq um, in, in Jordan. The local government there seems uh, also to have 
had an invested interest in keeping the community engaged. And so the project continued after the USAID ID funds um, have, have ceased. There must be an update to the methodology of community archaeology to guarantee its sustainability after funding stops. There must, this must be carried out either through uh, different forms of endowment, even if small, it would keep the community archaeology activities sustainable through the civil society, non-governmental organizations, or the local colleges and universities. As of March 2020, many of the archaeological sites and museums have closed their doors because of COVID-19 worldwide. This has got many heritage professionals to think about accessibility. This has encouraged different museums and archaeological sites to engage with the multiple publics online. With the world facing a strong challenge of not just health concerns of the pandemic, but also loss of funding, loss of jobs, and the inability to access heritage, which many times include areas of spiritual and mental recreation. Such inaccessibility to engage with the past physically has created a discourse about power, justice and injustice, privilege, comfort and care. I believe that the lockdown in many Western countries have created a new understanding of how it is difficult not to have access to culture and perhaps prompted many academics and heritage professionals to ask the uncomfortable questions regarding empathy, responsibility, cultural human rights for the source countries and audiences. Can enabling engagement with heritage on social media instigate critical thinking and reflections? Um, how also the different communities and the migrant communities in the Western countries, Western public and um, indigenous communities all suffering the inaccessibility to the heritage. Uh, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, how can we all, after acknowledging the inequalities of the past, deal with them in the present to build bridges for the future, where the most beautiful immigrant in Berlin can get a chance to visit home or the spoils of war in the British Museum would go back to their historical context or the dynamited ceiling of the Dendera Zodiac in the Louvre would be reinstalled in its own temple. The Benin bronzes would go back to heal the community from the crimes of colonialism. The Hammurabi cod would go back to Baghdad to help shape and hear the future of Iraq that has been destroyed by colonialism and neocolonialist wars. We cannot continue going to do our same archaeological and heritage work and pretend that what was important only is how we present our excavation reports to the academic community. Community public archaeology methodologies need to evolve and the activities must be tied to community-based development and the 2030 SDGs agendas. Unless a new discourse is created to form an evolved ethical standpoint that overshadows a new philosophy for our practice, the heritage that we are keepers of might not survive for long without a strong community support. Community support and identity would be formed with restituted cultural rights. It is not only the repatriation of the objects that is needed, but the repatriation of knowledge and the power to build a more meaningful future that is more equal in terms of cultural, social, and economic rights. The repatriation is also repatriating access to the shared archaeology and shared heritage space to heal from the past inequalities and create different times with the future through the past. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful lecture and reinforcing for us all the responsibilities that we have to the people of the countries where, where we work. I know in my own time in Egypt, we were, we were bringing on young Egyptian archeologists in the universities, uh, but it was, we needed more. We, we were aware of that. And I, I love 
that these, these community projects are happening, I love less that once the funding goes away, they disappear. And it seems to me that's a, that's a project that we should all get involved in and possibly ASOR um, because these are such wonderful programs, but if they die after a year or two, it's hard to see, well, we need lasting value. That's all yeah, I want to say. I, I definitely agree. Yes, because uh, I've worked on, um, on one for three years and as soon as the funding stops, everything else stops and, and there must be another way to, to manage that. Um, okay, we have some questions up and you know, to give you a break, I'm going to read them aloud so everyone can hear them and then um, you can take a stab at answering. Okay. Uh, the first one is thank you for so many insights. I was particularly struck by the lack of continued engagement in community archaeology projects. In addition, in addition to revising how such projects are funded, what other chains do you recommend to make these more sustainable? Um, I think to make them more sustainable, first they need to have to be truly collaborative, uh, which means that they must be carried out through local partners. These local partners could be either uh, local universities, local um, stakeholders, local NGOs, and there must be a, a shared responsibility of setting an endowment, setting something that's creating an, um, a sustainable economic revenue in which such engagement can continue because it needs years and years to to stand on its feet it's usually these projects are funded maximum for three years and by the time the money comes in the activities are carried out it's usually a year or two and unfortunately many of the times these community projects do not even receive security clearance to do the work because um, sometimes um, there are worries for the security of the foreigners doing the work. Um, and so the best way is that the foreign missions would have local partners that are trained to do this community work who also would have um, um, a, long, a, a longer investment uh, in the method. So I think uh, this would really help um, the community projects remain more sustainable. Very, very, very good points. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a second question here. Dr. Hanna, thank you for a very thoughtful, insightful talk. I may have missed this in your lecture, but are you stating that there is a direct lineage between the ancient Egyptians and the people who live there now? Um, I think there are many anthropological um, uh, publications about that. Um, there is even a recently a, a very nice book by Anthony Satton called The Pharaoh's Shadow. I suggest that you read this book because I've, I've just finished it myself. And um, besides, it's very well written. I think it's also very well researched, although Anthony is not an archaeologist. But I think the way he puts it and the way he writes about how ancient Egypt still survives in modern Egypt is very interesting. Okay. Uh, I will look for that, and I hope our questioner will, will as well. Um, uh, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, and and also we have many publications like the Lamentations. We have the work of Professor Faiza Haikal. There are many. There are many uh, very um, solid academic works on that. But I think the the book of the the Pharaoh's Shadow is also interesting to read uh, in its own and. I, I, it's the most, uh, the most recent publication. So I think um, it's a quite a nice read. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got questions coming in both on the question and answer and on the um, chat. So I'm gonna go back and forth between them. Okay. Uh, here's one, here's one from chat. Uh, thank you for a very interesting lecture. Do you know how were the archaeological finds from the excavations of Sinai that were given back to Egypt by Israel after the peace agreement received in Egypt? They were very, very well received. I know it was Professor Muhammad Abdel Masood went and brought them uh, himself. 
some of these objects are in the Cairo Museum. Um, some of them will also be displayed in the Grand Egyptian Museum. And I believe some will also be displayed in the Sharm el Sheikh Museum. So there is a full uh, catalog that was done uh, about them. And um, it's actually very well taken care of this collection. Thank you, that's good, that's good to know. Yeah. I was actually working in Rafia when the Sinai was given back to, oh. to Egypt. It was an exciting time Yeah. Uh, in many ways. Uh, here's a question that I'm sure it's a, I won't say, it's a difficult question and I know it's been in many people's minds but most are probably afraid to ask it. This is more of a statement than a question, but I'd like your response. I'm afraid for the objects sometimes. Repatriating them to some places could be dangerous to them. Well, I think this is again the Western protectionism because you see the, the Berlin uh, last week had a very strong attack where uh, uh, glue and oil was poured over different archeological statues. And we also have had several thefts from German uh, museums. So it's just that usually the, the danger is more, I think, played out when it's in the source countries, but it's more played down when it's in Western countries. Of course, any accidents could happen, but I believe in, um, in Egypt, uh, things are very different now. Things are very well taken care uh, of now. and. Um, I mean, accidents happen everywhere. Yeah. And then again, if, I mean, this is perhaps not applicable for an Egyptian situation, but what if we repatriate an African object that is part of a living heritage where this object should be destroyed as part of a tribal uh, tradition? How do we feel about it? And when I've discussed this before at the Goethe Institute in the Ethnographische Museum in Berlin, most of the anthropologists said, that's okay, this is part of the history of the object. And we have fully documented it, we have 3D scanned it, and we're happy to give it back. But most of the archaeologists were very scared, they wanted, they wanted to keep the object and not send it back. So I think it's, it's, um, it's an interesting debate. Yes, it is. And we're, we're not um, unaware of it here in the US, huh? you know, our big repatriation issues with our Native American heritage yeah. is, is ongoing and much debated. And there's been, I would say, a sea change from yeah. the early 90s when the NAGPRA law was initially passed mm -hmm. and, and today. Um, the newer, the younger anthropologists have been brought up on yeah. the respect for these I These think archaeology is, is destructive in its own manner. We destroy the context to understand. Yes. So in a way, we destroy the past to understand it. Why do we deny the other communities also to interact with heritage just because we see it's not scientific from, from an archaeological perspective? Yeah. Uh, here's, we'll move on. Uh, this, you're generating a lot of questions. That's a, <laughs> that's a sign of a great talk uh, here. Thanks for your excellent talk. The idea of creating an endowment to enable successful community projects to continue and thrive after funding comes to an end is an excellent idea. Can you suggest or give some examples to show how this can be achieved sustainably? I think it could be created either through NGOs uh, working around these sites. There are many NGOs created uh, in Egypt or through universities. There is there are many universities in Egypt that receive endowments, uh, endowments for research, endowments for scholarships, and it, this could be part of the endowments as well. So either for universities or for non-governmental organizations. I think this would, would help the sustainability uh, of these projects and also maybe um, an endowment for other institutions like the RC, the IFAO, something, um, an institution that, that is in Egypt throughout the year where they can continue doing this work sustainably. Yeah, you know, I remember the time when we didn't put publication funds, we didn't put conservation funds into our grants and now those are standard and uh, probably this sort of thing should become standard. But of course that doesn't help with when the grant disappears. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how, how to get an endowment. Endowments are hard. Uh, and that, that 
it's not, I do not mean that as a negative yeah. question, perhaps response is just, But okay. even, even if they're sm in small amounts, even if the, the grant itself is put as an, the grant amount is put as an endowment, even if the activity is small, but it is sustainable, I think it will have a much stronger effect than doing it just for a shorter period and doing it uh, on a larger scale. Yeah. Um, we have, ASOR has some State Department funded initiatives in Libya where we're, where we're doing this quite successfully. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, next question. Thank you, Dr. Hanna. How can a non-heritage professional in the USA participate in and support community archeology? span there are many initiatives. I believe the best is through RC. Uh, RC have great programs and they have tried to do some community archeology span themselves. Um, I think um, that would be probably the, the, the easiest way to get in touch with the RC people, the RC chapter in the different states, uh, contact them, ask them to get involved and I believe they could, they could find a way. Okay. Um... Just for our non-professional, uh, Dr. Han is talking about RC, the American Research Center in Egypt, which has local societies and has an annual meeting, much like this one, but in the spring. And if you, you know, Google it, you'll find out where the nearest chapter is that you could get involved with. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next question. Thank you for that wonderful talk. What advice do you have for American students who are studying archaeology and just beginning to explore their own privilege? What might you say to them to inspire them to continue to reach out and work on cultural heritage issues, even if they go on to other careers? Um, you know, I started out as an engineering student. <laughs> and uh, my mother actually was the one who told me do what you really are passionate about because you're going to be really good at it. And after spending a whole year at university studied, studying engineering, I switched majors. So I think um, do what you're really passionate about and try to figure out what you really like about archeology span and heritage that you can make meaningful to, to real life. Um, for example, um, we've just started a project called Action for Restitution in Africa. And we've received funding through OSF and uh, our partners are University of Oxford. I have students who are working from the computer science department and from the political science department working on the project. So try also to find interdisciplinary ideas that you can develop on your own. That would be meaning to the meaningful to the public or meaningful to the nearby community. I think uh, this would really be helpful. Good ideas, thank you. Um, Thank you. Next. Are there efforts in process to return material artifacts? If they are eventually returned, could they go on loan? When you stated that the lockdown demonstrated how difficult it is to access culture, this really hit home. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, there, there are, uh, after the Macron uh, statement uh, in 2018 to repatriate different African um, archaeological objects from French museums, uh, the discourse has been introduced to many academic circles in Europe. Um, and even uh, we now have this project with the University of Oxford, the Pitt Rivers Museum um, are, are happy to repatriate 1,200 objects. Um, so um, it will not leave the Pitt Rivers Museum empty, as many of the people are afraid that this <laughs> would happen. <laughs> uh, but it, it is an ethical uh, implication. And um, I think it, uh, it would also um, focus on how we're thinking, how our career, how our discipline uh, would develop to be uh, more ethical and more just. And, and yes, I think also with the inability to access the museum and archaeological sites, uh, many of, of the people started relating on, it's exactly the same. Think of um, a young woman from Middle Egypt wanting to travel to see Nefertiti in Berlin. She'd, she'd probably never get the visa unless she has a stable job and she has a, a fat bank account. So it, the, it, the, the COVID-19 lockdown has, has helped us all think about such inequalities. 
And that leads right into the next question that you partially answered. Um, thank you, Dr. Hanna, for this really moving and thought-provoking talk. I was particularly struck by the idea that not only are objects not being repatriated, but also that it is so difficult for people in Egypt and other countries outside of North America and Europe to visit them and vice versa. Do you know if there has been any effort to create a travel fund for this purpose? Do you think that the creation of such a fund, perhaps that these world museums are required to give to, would be helpful? Yes, indeed. No, there, <laughs> there hasn't been a fund that has ever created that this, this does not exist. Um, and actually, one of the things that I've been doing is trying uh, through uh, the Cologne University of Cologne in Germany summer school is to bring students from Aswan to visit uh, the Egyptian collections in Germany. And it has been very successful. I've been doing this with Dr. Heinz Felder. Uh, we're looking for, of course, we could not take students last summer because of the lockdown. We hope to be able to continue doing that also in the upcoming summers. And one of the things we've also thought about is to create 3D prints and bring them to the different objects, uh, to the different communities, I'm sorry. So even if they cannot access the, the real objects, they cannot travel, perhaps we can also try working into keeping copies of the masterpieces uh, in these different communities. Of course, it's not an excuse for the museums not to repatriate and think of repatriating the different objects. Now, in some time, there's just no replacement for the real object. Yeah. Now, I'd seen pictures and, and models of Nefertiti numerous times. Yeah. And when I saw it in the Berlin Museum, I didn't know it was there. I was very young and I was um, <laughs> stuck in Berlin for a, a weekend. And I walked in and it was just stunning. I mean, absolutely stunning. Yeah. And I um, think um, also the the uh, reception of the bust of Nefertiti in the Egyptian popular culture is very interesting. Um, I'm thinking of actually writing just a paper about that because many Egyptians actually think that Nefertiti is in the Cairo Museum because she cannot mm. be abroad. She is a masterpiece. You see here uh, one of the military posters on uh, a military building and it has the bust of Nefertiti and written under it Cairo Museum because probably the soldier who made this poster would have never thought that the bust is actually not in Egypt. So yeah. it's <laughs> okay. Uh, here's a new one. Um, given that we have a good amount, given that we have spent a good amount of time this year online, yes, we have. Uh, could <laughs> online programs slash virtual museums perhaps create an understanding of local heritage that could create lasting impressions for the local communities? Yes, I believe yes. But then we also have to think that internet connection in Egypt is very poor. Most of the students are eating their internet bundles because they have to do online classes. So we must think that the quality of the files should be small and the language should also be in indigenous languages, Arabic, Swahili, yeah. but yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, here's a long one. Um, thinking about objects in circulation, you point to the ways that circulation has benefited Western countries, a form of plunder. Is there a way to keep the idea of circulation with all the possible benefits of exchange and the insights and understanding that may come to viewers who may not otherwise come on contact with cultural objects from Japan, Egypt, or Paris, but to ensure that the benefits of circulation are themselves circulated? Nefertiti was not an exchange, but could we imagine a future where a museum that wished to display a cultural object from a distant place would have to ante up with a cultural object or program or other resources to lend to the community of that distant place? Would such a model have a chance of redressing the injustice of plundering? Yeah, I think why not? And, um, and particularly related to the Nefertiti bust, actually when um, uh, Lefebvre in the 1920s found out that Borchardt took this fantastic object without showing it to him, um, Germany started negotiating that they would give us back, I think the golden breath of Friedrich der Gross, but then <laughs> we'd never received that. So yes, I mean, I think this would also help and would also change the different indigenous communities views about the other. And I think it's equally important uh, as well. 
يعني it does not of course it it would help uh, the the, the uh, tip the balance uh, to be more uh, just and I think it would give also an interesting cultural reflection to the different uh, communities. Okay. Here's a question somebody wants to know when the transcript of your talk will be available. Uh, that, of course, is a big, par big part of that is ASOR's job, but I would hope soon. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll finish the editing and send it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next one. What happens when regional museums do not have the resources to maintain the collections that they receive from excavation projects? Mm. I don't. I think uh, the example in Egypt is that they put them. They, they we have storerooms, and if they cannot put them on display, at least they're very well kept in and and catalogued. So this is also um, a, a good use if we cannot keep the museums open. You know, it's it's interesting. This is just an aside. I I worked in the Kelsey Museum at the University of Michigan for a long okay. time. And a big part of our our Egyptian collection were things were duplicates that were purchased by uh -huh. Professor Kelsey from the Cairo Museum. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a shop in the early 20th century where you could go in and, and buy actual antiquities. Uh, um, it was there at the Cairo Museum until 1983, the year I was born. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are there endowments to help the poor children of these communities to pursue academic careers? No, there isn't. Uh, unfortunately, um, there isn't. We've been even trying to create an endowment for uh, my college, the College of Archaeology and Cultural Heritage, because we give 50% off tuition for students from Upper Egypt. It has been very difficult to find uh, endowments um, through the CSR of the different multinationals in Egypt and bank. Um, usually they, they give money for food, for shelter, for, to build hospitals, but unfortunately the, the, the corporate social responsibility in Egypt and um, the region um, still do not think of um, creating an endowment for education and cultural heritage of the different communities. Uh, there's so many things <laughs> yeah. to do to improve the yeah. world. Um, here's, a, here's a new new track. Can you tell us a little about the planning of the new archaeological museum in Cairo? Um, well, I've just passed, I've driven beside the, passed by it uh, last week. It's huge. It's uh, a colossal museum. And uh, I think uh, it, it would be probably inaugurated in a year or two. I think the, the display in it will be um, really something. I think it will be very different from anything that we've seen in Egypt. Yeah. Here's something that could be related. How much of Egypt's antiquities outside Egypt would you like repatriated? Um, I would, I think, um, I, I don't have a percentage, <laughs> uh, but I think there are many objects that were really, I mean, some of the objects uh, have left with the Partash system, but other objects were illegally uh, out. I mean, the Rosetta Stone is a perfect spoil of war. It's, prop it's the representation of imperialism where the Brits took it from the French who took it from uh, 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 Egyptian soil and it was given to the British as a spoil of war. So I think there are, each case is different. So I don't see a percentage, but I think that the, the objects that um, um, pose a real uh, engagement with the past and real pride with the past, I think they should be uh, repatriated. Of course, many of the museums will continue retaining their objects, but I think there should be more important than repatriating the objects, we must repatriate the knowledge. It's the, it's, it's the knowledge more and the accessibility to the knowledge that uh, Egypt needs more than the, phys the physical objects might be repatriated uh, in the future, in the near or the uh, or further future, but what we need immediately at the moment the repatriation of the knowledge. Thank you. I'm gonna, we've got our members meeting coming up. And in fact, there's just one, a couple more questions. I'm gonna make this the last one. Okay. Um, and thank you, you've, you've been doing uh, 
double duty here. You've been talking for an hour and then we give you this whole half hour of questions, but it's great. Um, thank you for your work in this presentation. My work involves assisting museums in learning how their artifacts and exhibits affect the various members of their communities. I find it interesting that many museum curators and boards are often dismissive of what they read as negative results regarding minority, minority in quotes, minority groups viewing yeah. artifacts in their museums that relate to that minority group. Do you have any thoughts on community museum boards and their reactions to such observations and recommendations? Um, I, well, actually the people, if you know, if you're familiar with Egypt, the West Thebes, uh, when they uh, relocated the people of Gorna, the mm -hmm. local people of Gorna wanted to have their own culture museum and this museum never happened. So uh, I think there, there, there could be voices of such, I don't like using minority groups, but different community uh, groups in, in representing their own culture and how their museums um, ought to be created. Also similarly for Sarah Beat al Khedem when I worked, the local people wanted to have their heritage represented in a certain manner, but still this did not uh, fly. So I think, yes, this, this ought really uh, to happen. Okay, well, I need to bring this to an end. As wonderful as it is, uh, we're, we're up against time's winged chariot here and um, need to break before the members meeting. But thank you, Monica. Thank you so, so much for this Thanks. splendid lecture and Th this point of view. Thanks, Sharon. It has been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully next year, I'll, I'll try to come and attend uh, next Astros meeting in person. And I'll try to make it to Egypt. <laughs> yes, that would be lovely. I'd I would love, love to... to see your school in Aswan. Aswan yeah. is my favorite city in Egypt. We have great students there. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. And there's just much, much praise coming in. <laughs> great. great. Love thank that. you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to respond uh, via email whenever uh, needed. Okay. All right. Thanks. We'll get some rest now. <laughs> ah, I will. It's been very intense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right.